Jeff Stearns connected through cars with my great friend, Sean Mara. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have Sean on the show today. On the screen, you're going to see this leather optional ad, and there's a big story behind it. And what's so interesting about it, when I was running a dealership, I asked Sean for a particular mission. And he pulled it off, but he didn't just pull it off like, oh, here's an interesting ad. But pre-influencer, they were influencers in town that Sean incorporated into these ads. You're going to find it fascinating. You really need to watch this. Jeff Stearns, connected through cars. If they're bigwigs, we'll have them on the show. And yes, we'll talk about cars and everything else. Here he is now, Jeff Stearns. Kind of before there was influencers, right? Influencers before. No, and we didn't know they were influencers. Now we know they were influencers. Let me set it up. I take over as general sales manager of a Cadillac Land Rover dealership in Clearwater, Florida. At the time, this dealership was in a southern mansion uh, architecture building that had marble floors, brass chandelier in the showroom, and a little bit like a funeral home. When people would come in, they would whisper. And if their kids were making noise, they'd be like, Billy, be quiet. You're in the mansion. And we were, we had a little bit, I mean, a very, very loyal clientele and we loved the, the heck out of the customers. And we had what we called the five horsemen. We had five salespeople there that were there between 16 and 34 years. And one of them was the only living original charter member of what they called the Cadillac Crest Club, which was a, a you know, a certain sales achievement. Guild. So even though, I mean, the, the, the halls were hallowed and had some talent in there and some accomplishment, we were trying to shift the personality and shift the public persona. Am I saying that right, Sean? Yeah, well, I mean, times were changing. It was a different, it was uh, mid 90s and there was a lot of change. The Gen Z was, was coming up and was going to be the next customer of your store and many other stores for the next 20, 30, you know, 40 years. And uh, there was a lot of change in the marketplace and with culture and with what was accepted, what wasn't accepted. It was a really, really interesting time. And if you recall going back that far, you know, it was the alternative, you know, revolution, the alternative music and art and culture and um, the world was changing. So it was just a very interesting time, especially in Tampa Bay as a whole. Well, and the brands, Sean, the brands. And I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, right at that time when we got together, Cadillac came out with the Katerra that later became the CTS and the Cadillac that zigs. And even though that may or may not have been the greatest campaign idea or, you know, slogan idea in the world, they were saying this is a different Cadillac. They were trying to, trying to break the mold. And Land Rover had gone through a little transition too, because Land Rover, of course, was owned by the original parent. And then BMW took them and then Ford took them. And I may have that out of order. And then, of course, later after you and I did this project together, it was the uh, Indian Tata company that took uh, Land Rover and Jaguar and kind of really put both of them on the map. They've done a great job for an a- for aspirational vehicles. But Cadillac and Land Rover were both struggling a little bit uh, with identity, quality concerns. And, you know, you'd mentioned like this alternative lifestyle. So we can talk about the nightclub crowd. Well, it was, it wasn't really the nightclub cloud as much as it was the actual scene stirs, right? These were the new soon to be hipsters, right? What took over, you know, parts of Brooklyn in the, in the late nineties. And these were the hipsters and these were the people that were in the art scene and the music scene. And, you know, got to remember the whole world was changing the birth of different bourbons and, you know, culturally, you know, it's almost like it was almost like a resurgence of, you know, the, uh, you know, the liquor industry and there was so many things happening with entertainment and digital media was coming online and, you know, all of the just incredible changes that were taking place from that, you know, early nineties into the time that we're talking about, which was, you know, in 96 and 97. And, you know, um, I think when we shot that, it was right in that 97, right. If I'm not mistaken, 1997 is what we're talking about. 99 discovery. 
99. Yeah. So very, very interesting time, 99, but it was coming out of that time frame. And, uh, you know, really in that mid nineties is really where a lot of the, what culminated into that campaign and with the influencers that were in that campaign, the Tampa Bay influencers, so to speak, at the scene stirs, the hipsters, and, uh, some of them went on to do some great things. And, uh, you know, some of them were signed in, you know, record deals with Columbia records and toured with the Goo Goo Dolls and others were, you know, influencers in the scene to your point, which was, that nightclub scene. It was really basically a music scene, right? That's really what was happening outside of the live music scene in Tampa Bay, which was really rich in that time frame. You also had, and not only that, remember you had bands getting signed all over Florida and, you know, that were blowing up from Matchbox 20 to, you know, Creed to, uh, you know, even Marilyn Manson. I mean, it was just Florida was rich. Well, and, and what was going on geographically in St. Petersburg specifically. Yeah, pretty interesting, right? This little hotbed of culture so and art. So it was really a scene that went way beyond, I think, the bar scene. And that's where a lot of the – that's where the actual – you know, the models for the ads, the influence for the ads were picked, were, were picked, were from that scene, you know, the music scene, the art scene. So let's talk about them like one at a time as we'll have them on the screen. So, and let's leave our, you know, the, the coupe de resistance for last. So my brother, Michael, was working for you. Michael had entertained working for me for a short period of time. And um, I think basically sat in on the office and got to hear what we did working with car dealers around the country. Um, and I think made a couple of visits in some uh, outside of you, his brother, and uh, quickly, immediately uh, teed somebody else up and kind of like a shuck and jive move was like, hey, listen, I don't think I'm going to take the job. However, I got somebody perfect for you. And that was his way of kind of handing off, you know, the, the position to somebody else once he realized uh, that we were in this crazy car dealer world. I don't think that was really his choice. But Michael did introduce me to you. That's that's how I met you. And and ultimately, you were his first customer. Uh, we did some targeted direct mail, which was our core one of our core competencies at the time at the agency that led into our great relationship and coming to see you in person and uh, learning about what your goals were and what your challenges were and what you needed to do to, to basically shake the mansion up and to get a new breed of customer in there. And that's what you charged me with. I left that. I, I, I'll never forget coming into the office and we were, yeah, the mail's great and it worked and it's always going to work. And we're always going to get, you know, that two and a half, three percent response. We're going to sell a handful of cars from it. It was like, but that's not going to solve the problem. And you left me with, uh, you know, you sent me out the door saying, hey, figure that out and, and I'll be interested in doing something. But I don't need any more mail. Right. That's basically what it came down to. And uh, I need something more than that. And uh I went to the, as we say, the lab. Well, and Michael oversold me. Well, I don't want to say Michael oversold me on you, but when my brother says, I'm working with this guy, Sean. Um, look, I'd been in the car business. I was already a veteran. I was the GSM at a Cadillac dealership. At this point, I'd seen direct mail. You know, everyone watching this, whether they're in the car business or not, has gotten their mailbox stuff with direct mail. But what I really wanted was something different. And I told Michael, and he goes, listen, I really think this Sean, this guy, Sean, can do it. And I let you know, Sean, I can't have everyone whispering in this mansion and thinking that it's not cool to come into. I want it to feel like a casino atmosphere when people coming in. I want it to feel like people winning. I want it to be inviting. And I want it to be inviting to everyone besides a DeVille buyer. Not that we weren't grateful to have the DeVille business. But, yeah, we, we already had the DeVille buyer playing bingo on the church uh, bingo machine out in the service drive. And God bless those customers. We needed them. They were our bread and butter. You had the vision. You have to get, we have to grow with a new audience, right? If the older audience is, you know, in essence, dying off, right? That's the reality of it. They're, they're getting older. As we used to say in the media business, right? The radio business, they're falling off the dial at, you know, a certain age. They stop listening to rate, right? It's just the reality. Consumers age out and we have a, we have an LTV of a customer, but the reality is, is we have to pick up these new customers and we have to find new, the new audience, right? And that's something that you had the vision to see is how do we get them in here 
we have a product line that may not necessarily be so appealing. The the Katera and the Caddy that Zig campaign was just bubble. It was just starting to come out. It was it was not really resonating the way it was supposed to. It wasn't getting people into the store because it was kind of like a contrived way to be cool, and it wasn't resonating with Gen Xers at all. Um, it was just very GM, right? Madison Avenue, just very vanilla. Um, and it just didn't connect with the audience. It did, and maybe because the influencer thing had not really been born yet, but we were doing street marketing and we had our finger on the pulse of the markets and we were out there in real street marketing teams, um, applying this kind of influencer marketing back in the nineties. Um, and we were using it from a, from a street marketing standpoint and it was, uh, doing intercepts and, and, and using influencers in, in marketplaces that would influence based on usage of a product. We were doing that in the Reno market with the Winkle group. And that was something that we were really big on. And we thought that we, th- we thought that we could carry it over for you when we, when we had the orders and I'll let you take over from there. So, well, no, you, well, you came up with this idea and I got to tell you like what was going on internally. I did a lot of this when I was there is how am I going to get this past my owner and let's just do it anyway, because <laughs> I don't think my owner's going to go for this. So you came in, you know, a little bit like Darren from Bewitched with the storyboard of, you know, here's the idea and it really blew us away. So as these slides are on the screen, as these images are on the screen, uh, let's talk about the first one. What's the first one you want to talk about? Well, I think the first one is really the first set was before um, the entry of the male leather optional. So you got to start with really how it started. And the storyboards were, and we'll start with number one, the female version of leather optional, which we've, which we, yep. And the first ad this individual who this influencer was, you know, in the hair, was in the hair industry, was very just well known in the marketplace and an influencer or family is in essence influencers on the, on the fishing and the construction side. So these were just very well known young people in the marketplace. But this particular individual, Naki, who is still uh, today an incredible influencer in Brooklyn and uh, in the hair industry, uh, agreed to do this shoot. And uh, she immediately loved the idea of the leather optional concept. And of course, it tied into the vehicle. So it was a perfect way to kind of make this car that just wasn't cool, right? They say you, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still not going to, well, it might still be cute, but you, it, there was nothing we could do with the Katera th- to make it even cute. It, it just wasn't even a catchy little tagline like they had, um, which we were just knew was a big turnoff. So that was the one of the first and most important parts of the ad was that leather optional and to be able to kind of just grab people's attention with something that would be somewhat shocking. And uh, remember, also in Tampa Bay, there was a very big culture of alternative lifestyle and to this day there is still conventions here for you know uh, what would be more more apt to using you know leather and chains and whips and dips and chips and all that fun stuff so this stuff was kind of relevant for tampa bay too it wasn't just like shocking because a girl had leather and it was leather optional and it grabbed your attention like a good ad should do but it allowed us to have a series of these that made it fun and made it funny, right? Which was also then the second part of that storyboard, which none of these were obviously shot. They were just drawn out on a storyboard and was the plenty of leg room, which was this bride, this groom. She's pulling him into, which at the time was the Land Rover, which did not really have, right? You can explain more as the, as the GSM Jeff of, of Land Rover at the time. The challenge is Land Rover. At the time. And I mean, and Land Rovers still have their reputation for little sniggles, you know, being an English car. How do you, you know, what's the problem with a Land Rover when you don't see oil underneath it? You know, it means it's empty, right? Why don't the English make computers because they can't make them leak? Did you guys actually have like a, like the best jokes about Land Rovers at the time? Well, I mean, I later, <laughs> later got into Rolls and Bentley, so... It was definitely always an English car thing. My my Bentley rep, God rest his soul, Rodney, just loved to death Scottish guy, says, it's, sir, it's not a leak. It's a location of lubrication problem. Straight face to a customer. The uh, Land Rover is English, so it was quirky. There were people that loved it because of what it was. It was unbelievable off-road. 
like nothing like it. And if you recall, we had a couple of acre Land Rover test track out back to get it stuck and winch it out and whatever degree break over angle and side angles and whatever and with the center of gravity, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it did not have plenty of leg room. All the things you'll do in Tampa Bay, by the way, with a Land Rover. Everything, everything, and everything that the hipsters and, you know, let's see, you know, I got to be politically correct because I'm always politically correct on these podcasts. But let's say, hmm, who would like to drive those? Uh, Let's see. They might like Disney, like Miatas. They like me. (laughs) And they like their Land Rovers. And I can tell you that I did increase the gay. You did increase the gay when my ad came up. Finally, we got a little bit in there. And it was funny because a couple of times, you know, we're not onto my ad yet. But when we got to the the one that I was in, uh, just a few times, someone would be like, well, I'm trying to close them on payment or something, would be like, was that you in that ad? And it was fun. I mean, it was definitely fun. I want to wait until we get to that ad, but we're now at the leather optional. I'm sorry, we're, at the, we're now at the plenty of leg room. And you're asking, describe that car. It had no freaking leg room. It was, it was a giant exterior with a tall roof. And I guess it was an engineering problem because inside it had nothing. But we wanted to appeal to that SUV, that crossover, right? It wasn't about riding the rocks. It wasn't about, you know, you can, you got a winch that can pull, right? This was about driving around Tampa Bay and, and going, and go, right? This was about appealing to the soccer moms of that time. And, and uh, not only the soccer moms, but ultimately the hipsters and everybody else in the Tampa Bay area that would be, were more interested in those SUVs and, and what was burgeoning as that SUV, rich SUV market. Well, Sean, I mean, I got to interrupt because there was a little bit of an off-road culture in Tampa Bay. So right after I joined as general sales manager of that dealership, I think it was a 4th of July or it was certainly around then, I ended up visiting a buddy of mine, Chris Warren, at his new house, and he had a retention pond behind the house. And I've been I've been to the Land Rover driving school, and we got the rock out front that we got it cocked sideways on. So I know the thing's invincible. I says, he goes, is this your new demo? I'm like, nah, I just wanted to drive it over because you got this retention pond out back. I'm going to show you something. So I go drive it around the side of his house and around his birdcage pool and everything around the back, get it all in between the trees and whatever, fold the mirrors in so I get it there. And I drive it down, super sharp angle, the side of this retention pond and like touch the front bumper to the water and throw it in reverse and I get out of it. And everyone's like, wow, that looked a little scary. I'm like, that's nothing. Watch this. Take it down a little further, halfway up the grill. Back it up. The thing, you know, like like a bulldog. Back it up. Goes right out. Everyone's like, oh, my God. I says, it didn't really feel like a lot of effort. Let me try it again. I go down a little deeper and drink water. Motor drinks water. We end up getting two tow trucks where they both had to hook their cables up to it in the backyard to pull the thing out and I'm like my f- second week on the job and I ingested water in- into an engine, like mothballed an engine in a brand new. So there was a big off-road <laughs> underground going on. But the big question is, is why three times? The, the two times wasn't enough? Because I got out the first, I had to go a little further down. I'm Jeff Stearns. My drug of choice is more. Yeah. <laughs> Just give me another one. They, they were all in on the first one, right? You could have sold four from the first one. <laughs> you first, no, right, I lost them all on the third. <laughs> I talked way past the close. I talked way past the close of that. But your ad campaign was genius because, you know, right now everyone has an SUV or a crossover. I mean, almost no passenger cars sell anymore compared to SUVs and crossovers. But at that time, an SUV was kind of novel i mean it was that it was an explorer i mean that was it just a few escalade wasn't out yet i mean there was nothing like that and you were actually putting a little spotlight on that and if i recall the the uh, newspaper came out weekly and you ran 12 weeks i think everything ran three times or something right except the one bonus ad 
It did. And each week there was a new, a new ad running. So it built that, it, it kept the story and the theme going. And then the third week, and yes, it did, it did actually put a highlight on that. And we were looking to focus on the utility and the soccer mom and the hipster. And hey, this is a, this is, this is a vehicle again, you know, that we position with the plenty of leg room. Well, and you have plenty of leg room and my owner, we didn't tell anything about it. And once he came down and it was like, Oh my God, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, listen, we're locked in the agreement, the contract. We can't stop it now. And he's like, but do you know what leg room, what leg means? <laughs> <laughs> we sure do. I mean, it is a bride and a groom. Um, you know, as we could see, we, 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 we made sure it was politically correct. It's a bride and a groom. They're, they're so excited about each other. They can't wait to get into their brand new, uh, Land Rover, by the way, from Dimmit. I mean, how cool is that? Um, to be able to consummate the marriage. I mean, how fantastic and what a great. It's not about political correctness, Sean. <laughs> it was moral. Yes, I get it. You know, like that's all of a sudden something we shouldn't be doing. But the good news is, is that that, that ad with the plenty of leg room, you know, I think also b- related to a different audience in addition to the leather optional, right? Starting with the week one that was kind of grabbed your attention and really just, you know, shook the market up, which it did and created a lot of talk value leading up to that more softer that now is the more normalized family right the mid 90s uh, the mid late 90s family young family just getting married and by the way two very important influencers but one mainly billy wells who's in that he's to uh toured with the goo goo dolls uh, was in a band called gun burner signed to columbia records and he was an influencer and and very well known even to this day produced by matt wallace who did faith no more and maroon five and just a really incredible artist and influencer in the tampa bay area especially at that time so billy and then rachel who was a designer from parsons who was in that ad and also in the scene as uh as as you call it and were you in the music business then, Sean, when he signed to Columbia? I did. So when I was running the what, what became Big Gross, which was a traditional agency, and we flipped it to take advantage of the dot-com in 98, right when we were doing this, we were kind of transitioning the company into a dot-com. But it was a traditional agency focused on direct response originally. And, and one of my side, yes, one of my side ventures was uh, uh, I was a founder and an investor in a record label. That record label was called Stainless. And it ran alongside of the agency. That was kind of like the hobby. You know, that's what I did for fun. I didn't play golf and I didn't, you know, play cards. That was what I was into, right? And and that was a really incredible, you know, expose and marketing and uh, what we were able to accomplish with MP3.com, the early days of MP3. That's a whole different. So we'll do a different show on that. But Billy was a part of that, and we were the we, literally nine ninety thousand downloads of of one of his uh, tracks at that time. Put us on the put us in Rolling Stone magazine article, uh, Business Two Point Oh. It was a really great time. So he was in that ad, and I picked him purposely. He was tall and good looking, and we made him look a little bit less rock star, as you could tell, and just look look like the good good looking guy next door, the South Tampa guy making you know making that six figures that wants to uh, flex and show off that very cool you know urban assault vehicle uh, with his beautiful wife. So uh, you know. Uh, sex and rock and roll, right? So far as what we're, what we're accomplishing and also, uh, the standards of, of, uh, society. So we, we're kind of touching on everybody there. So the third ad was using uh, an influencer in the area who was really big. Her name was Roxanne Escabala. So we got Billy Wells in, in ad two and Rachel at the Rachel Myers and then Naki Karcher in the first one. And then the third ad was, was Roxanne Escabalas. And she worked at the, at, uh, Red Star, which was a very popular, Art infused nightclub and acid tub jazz, and she was an influencer in the in the art culture and worked at uh, was a writer and a really great writer for the week for the Creative Loafing Weekly Planet, a really great writer and wrote great great stories and and you still a writer to this day. But Roxanne, who had this incredible hair as you can see, and there was a no brainer. It was like, look, you know plenty of headroom and that was the perfect thing to be able to use Roxanne for with that funky you know 90s that whole dance music scene and that just beautiful big Mediterranean hair you know just 
it was perfect and it just all came together and from the storyboard to what it what it, what it was like when it got shot and and i think that that ad was able to relate to again females and 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 be able to really talk to young females in a different way about vehicles that they normally may have never looked at sean but you got to understand an audience you got to understand we're in this cadillac dealership that up till now has really just been cadillac and the traditional cadillac customer from their, you know, kind of high-end retirement communities and or, or been buying there for 40 years. And, and I was really skeptical when my brother introduced me to you because I'm like, eh, what are we going to get out of this little weekend rag that you look at to see which restaurant to go to or, or who's got what band where or in the very, very back, the whatever seeking whatever ads you know in the and i'm like are we even gonna get anything but the beautiful thing about these ads i mean look i like anything fun and i like a little shtick and i like to be edgy no doubt so when you were showing them to me i'm like my god what talent but i was thinking are we gonna get anywhere in this rag and when these were coming out i couldn't go anywhere without someone bringing one up because they were so, plenty of headroom i mean it was so edgy for a Cadillac dealership in Clearwater, Florida, not a Cadillac dealership in L.A., a Cadillac dealership in Clearwater, Florida, not San Fran, not New York. So you got to remember, though, Jeff, one of the things it wasn't just what you wanted to accomplish in the vision that, hey, I can I, I want to go after a different audience. We got to find a new way to sell new, you know, sell these new cars to younger people, build a new audience and that next cost that next 10, 20 years of customers. So. The one of the things why you guys, if you remember, in that storyboard, there was also the data, the demographics of and the readership of what was happening in those magazines. They were really substantial, those weeklies. And it was tapping a whole nother audience that you guys were missing. And it was audited and it was documented of what those numbers were. And that's why you guys are like, oh, well, this, this does make sense. Because on paper, the numbers were stronger than, than even you know, the times when it came to, right? Or, or at the time, the Tribune as well, you had both of them. You know, you had two competitive Bay Papers. If you're not local, and Sean, remember, we're not just talking to local people on this show. Uh, not only are we all over the United States, but our number two uh, download is not even Canada. I think uh, it's France. So the St. Petersburg Times or the Tampa Tribune. That's it. Those were your two. So those are newspapers, which the young people are like, freaking new. How old are these freaking guys? Newspaper. Yeah. And, and, and then they weren't reading the newspaper, just like what happened with that. That, that's a trend that did not stop. Right. And, uh, they were looking for alternative sources of content and the internet was there now giving them that. Right. It's 99. So think about how much content people had access to now. And really, the world had changed greatly by the time that we did these ads as far as that younger Gen X that was that was basically consuming content differently. They adopted they adopted technology a lot faster than their their generation before them, their parents. Right. You know, and they were right there at this major boom of the Internet. So the numbers in those magazines or those weekly those weeklies were were really strong. I think I I can't remember exactly, and I hope I'm not wrong, but I actually can remember. I think somewhere in the tune of, I think the average income might have been sixty plus thousand dollars, and uh, of the average reader of 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 it at the time, and um, it was just the numbers were really solid. And then when you broke down what the psychographics were of that readership in those demos, it was really just like, yeah, these are those people that we want. And by the way, I mean they were thick. I mean they were loaded in advertising and loaded in. And all of the best local, not so good, but the majority and 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 the and the big uh, box stores and different types of national retailers were starting to put money in those papers at the time, if you remember. So it also gave you, it gave you guys a little more confidence there too, because you weren't the only you were the only dealer that had cracked the code, especially from a high line dealer standpoint, you were the only dealer that cracked the code and did anything like that before. So that was a first, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, other fortune 1000 brands had started to sniff around and, and, and advertise in the weeklies at that point. And, um, then that series, which was very successful and, and was launched, then spawned the fourth ad, which was a, which was like an add on, which was great because by this time, I believe 
you know, the excitement, the enthusiasm. Uh, again, I'll share the, some of the, some of the, we'll call it small minded pushback and, and ignorance that, that you encountered getting hit with bird shit and stones in, in essence for something that really did accomplish what it was supposed to. But before we got there, you know, you had, I believe if I recall, cause I, one of the things that was great too, is that the shoot we did really was a great shoot. We did Todd Bates, who was the creative director, um, or at the time, I think the head photographer and then became the creative director of, uh, the creative loafing. Uh, I think to this day still involved, you could follow him on Instagram. Todd's an incredible artist as well, works with major companies and has produced just incredible, incredible photography and digital art. Just great creative direction. And he was the, uh, the guy who shot the first set of ads. And we had to bring in a different photographer. The second set, he wasn't available. I think Dave Monroe, who you went to his studio, if you remember, in, in um, Clearwater, actually. But when we brought you in to do that shoot, you had now kind of felt the enthusiasm of the market. And like you said, you everywhere you went, you were hearing things. And people were talking to you about it. And you know, if people are talking about something, right, the old saying, if they're talking about it, right, as long as they spell your name right, good or bad, they're talking about it. And good or bad, they were talking about it. And that's what was happening. And uh, you saw that. And I'm, you know, from a standpoint, I'll let you talk about what you saw in the store and what that translated to. But, but you, you wanted, we wanted to do another ad. And, that next ad was going to be you. So I don't know if you want to talk about that and how that all came together. <laughs> well, and I think, I mean, this is going back, but I think it was your idea. Why don't we put you in one? Well, actually, you told me that, I, I don't know, the, the leather chaps, right? The the leather, where did those come from? I think they were in the studio when I walked in. They were, they were, they were part of the props. Okay. I wasn't sure if you had told me that you had a pair of leather no, pants. No, or no. I told you that I had a pair of leather yeah, pants. Yeah. No, 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 no. No. So, I mean, outside of um, my new modeling career, I was very, very conservative. Wife, kid on the way, white picket fence, two Labrador retrievers, Republican. And fitness, and you guys were very fit, and and oh, it, right, yes, and you guys, fitness was a very good, a very important thing. I know that it happened very organically; it happened naturally in a conversation, and, and, and it happened very quickly. And then we we did the shoot. I think I think you said, "Do you want to do one, and we'll replace the leather optional girl with the whip with you?" And of course, I'm in on any practical joke or shtick, no matter what. And I told nobody in the dealership. I told nobody. I told no bosses, I told no coworkers, and you just told me where to be in Clearwater, and I show up, and all of a sudden I feel like a movie star because there's a little makeup, and you're, and you're putting this, these clothes on me, this leather vest, and I remember you put all these clips to make it fit down the back. Right? Yeah. Clothes pins or whatever they were. One of the things, too, that was going on, and, and you know, again, we'd have to go back and look through the watermark at the time, but I know that we were going to tap, you know, the LBGT community at the time. And the reality of it is, is that that was one of the main drivers was that we wanted to tap into the market and we were going to use you in that effort. We were going to run the campaign now, your, your campaign specifically in Watermark. And there was also something timely, like some big event or something. I'm not sure if it was pride or what was going on, Jeff, but we were tying into some type of event culturally that was taking place that watermark and we ended up just moving forward with that and so i know this what does watermark mean and which it's still out today watermark is a um lgbt weekly or a monthly publication at the time what's lbgt lesbian gay trans well thanks excuse me i live in <laughs> bye i live I in sorry, Palm I Harbor. i'm not in St. lgbt <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Didn't mean to mess that up. But uh, yeah, LGBT. I don't even know if they had all of that at the time. It might have just been LGB. I swear. I'm not, And I'm not being funny. I'm pretty confident that in 1999, I think it was LGB. Um, I think the only trans uh, that anyone knew about was in Crying Game at that time. Yeah, well... The reality is that it was a great opportunity to, to, to introduce. And if you remember, this is very important. So if you remember, 
We were also working with somebody who was a very big influencer and a big voice in the gay community. His name was Sterling Powell, and he's still here today. Sterling was a, an incredible artist. He worked with the city. He still works with the city to this day, curating all their art and everything. Um, but Sterling, if you remember, we were doing, and Sterling was really like a caricature. Sterling Powell was a caricature, uh, a caricature of himself. And it was this, you know, you know, this incredible abstract blend of Dolly meets, you know, this, uh, John Waters meets, right? It was meets, meets Jeff, who is the character behind Sterling, because he's a wonderful guy. And we'll put a picture of Sterling up here. I, I met Sterling a few times through Michael or you at, you know, different events. But if you remember, Sterling remembers this. If, if he watches this, we'll make sure we send it to him. Sterling, actually, you were going to go forward with it. We were going to make Sterling a... Basically, like basically a represent. We were going to give him a demo potentially, and he was going to. He was in the store for some reason. Now he was going to be. That. Yeah, he was yeah. going to be like an ambassador, and basically, to you know, it wasn't a good fit for you guys. I yeah, you know, I think you guys got a little bit of cold feet. You probably got a hard no upstairs, but um, because he's very flamboyant, but he he was an incredible advocate for AIDS, and he was one of the first people in Florida on the cocktail that saved his life. And uh, was a, was an incredible mouthpiece and advocate for AIDS and you know gay men affected inflicted with AIDS that were suffering and 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 to this day he's an incredible testament. So, th what was so magical about this campaign was really the people. It was the people that are in these ads that were real influencers in this market area that allowed you to tap a market and connect with an audience. By the way, many audiences, not just one. Many audiences across not just the Bay, but a region, because that, that thing covered a region in essence, right? Even though that magazine, it covered a region. And that's what made it so special. The photographers, Todd Bates, Dave Monroe on the second ad for you, which was history, right? That's why we're here today. You called me because, hey, people are still to this day bringing it up. Somebody had a, I think I saw your podcast you know, they had a baby because of the th the ad with the leather pants. That's right. That's right. I mean, that, I mean, it's flattering to me. It's humbling. It, it's but it's it's what the magic of that campaign was. It was the it was everything. The photographers. I already remember the girls who did the makeup. I think it was Star was the Star Makeup was the name of it or something along. I could I can remember all this because the characters were so rich and colorful off camera as well as on camera. And I have actual backstage shots, Jeff, I'll send over to you. Uh, I still have to this day of backstage, like with all of us, the models and everything, shot with the photographer. I don't know who took the picture. It might have been you. Somebody took the picture. But um, still to this day, have that picture. And it was really, that was the power and the magic in that campaign. It was the people. It was, it was who they were and what they were when the camera wasn't on them, when they were influencing and be, just being themselves and, and, and being creative types and, and uh, influencers in a market area. And when all that came together, coupled with, you know, what was happening in society in, in media and in digital and advertising and, and, and the early stages of influencers, which was really this, not just us, but there was a lot of what we see today was starting to really bubble under at the time. So really, really exciting and, and really energizing to have this conversation. That is for sure. That ad is 99. So here we are 22 ish years later and it still comes up. I don't like, for example, I'm a, VP of sales for chat lead, car chat, RV chat, boat chat, legal chat. So I don't meet a new client and say, by the way, did you know I was in this ad 20 years ago? But from time to time, I'll have somebody that I introduce to one of my clients or we share a client and that person will email or text them a picture of this ad to say, do you know who you're dealing with? And this has happened uh, you know, not every day, half a dozen times in the last few years. And now the customer will be like, you did that ad? And now we're on a whole new um, rapport level. This 20-year-old ad is just a, is a point of reference. That's all. And back then when it happened, so how my life changed when that happened, to me it was just like 
how could I say no? That's fun to like, let's go the shoot and not tell anybody. And I'm going to show up in this alternative lifestyle brag, uh, you know, weekly. Right. And how could I not enjoy that? Well, what happened that I didn't know, I walk in on whatever day it comes out. I walk in on the Monday or whatever day after. And we had a 34, give or take, bay shop. So we had 34 sets of toolboxes out there. If there weren't 25 to 30 toolboxes with my picture taped up next to the snap-on calendar, girl, I'll kiss your ass. I go get a haircut. God bless Ron Murphy, still alive. I'll have to send him this show. I go to get a haircut. There it is on his wall framed next to all of his celebrity autographed, whatever, you know, and magicians and, you know, all that business that were in his shop. Um, my poor father, and I was telling you this earlier, uh, I, you know, well, how old would he have been? So right now he would be 80 ish. That was 20 years ago. So 60 ish. Okay. So probably a 60th birthday that we threw at his house. We threw a surprise party at his own house. So he walks in, everyone's waiting. I didn't orchestrate any of this, but as he's opening gifts, probably 20 of them, and I'm not exaggerating, and it might have been 23, 20 of them are framed pictures, but this is already a year or two ago. You know, <laughs> so he's opening it like another one, another one. Like they all thought, like, you know, the poor father, like, uh, that's embarrassed because he's got the, you know, the leather optional with the whip or whatever. Is there, yeah, I got the whip. All right. Sun out there. So anyway, my son, who uh, we call it the basement in our house. We live in a stilt house, but we call it the basement. So that's the rec room, yeah. the party room, whatever. That's we also we call it Wuhan too because as soon as COVID hit and school let out, he was in his senior year of school. There was never less ever since the day school stopped because of COVID. Five to fifteen kids in that basement every day of our life. You know since that happened, but. That's all, you know, with all their party stuff, the fell off the pole street signs that are on the wall, you know, all the stuff they've got down there, their Jose Cuervo thing, whatever. There's that ad up on the wall. So my 19 year old son, I'm like, uh, whatever party icon, you know, for all the kids they toast or, I mean, they're 19. So of course they're not drinking, but it's their, uh, party icon. So that's really <laughs> that ad brother thanks to your creativity, is a, an absolute point of reference. And I think my wife, you know how like sometimes if you're with someone many, many, many years and you think of that they were the prom queen, so ho however they might look now, gained a few pounds, whatever, you still always remember, hey, man, she was the prom queen, like she was the one. My wife wasn't around then. Yes, she was born. Not very old. I think that she honestly looks at that picture and says, hey, my my husband was that hot once. <laughs> now, now, the only bad thing about it, and I mean, this is something that you can understand, that like people like us, the handicap that we have, the, the cross we have to bear, is sometimes when you're that good looking, people just don't think you're intelligent. That's right. Sean Mara, I can't tell you how happy I am that you joined me today. I mean, my God, we go back so long. For me, it was a fabulous conversation. And if this is the excuse, yeah, if this is the excuse I got to use to be able to have a conversation once in a while, because we're never just going to call each other and talk for an hour otherwise. Yeah. Can we put it on a podcast? That's what you're saying. Can I do this on a podcast? Because if someone calls me, it's like, do you need something? That's it, man. This is perfect. I'm in your living room, right? I don't look, I don't just visit with people unless it's on a podcast. You're in my living room. I know it's a fireside chat concept. I love it. It was great. This is awesome. Jeff, you are, listen, you are a visionary. This doesn't exist without you. It didn't exist without your budget, without your, without you writing the check from the Dimmit Family Trust, making it happen. So you are equally as important in it. Without you, it doesn't happen. And it's great to, dude, I'm honored that I can even talk about this this many years later. We, we felt special about it then. I feel even more special about it today, and I look forward to sharing it with everybody that I'm still in contact with that actually made it happen. So, hey, thanks for bringing it back to life. This has been Jeff Stearns, Connected Through Cars.